Good morning, everybody. <coughs> Can you hear me well? Yes. It's okay? First, I want to uh, thank, express all my thanks to the organizers of this most uh, stimulating conference. It's, uh, I'm so glad I finally uh, arranged for being with, with you here. And uh, <coughs> incidentally, before I forget, I should convey to you the kindest regards from Gordon Stewart, who uh, Dr. Dr. Duisburg just mentioned his, his very early contributions to the study of infectious diseases. I spoke with him three days ago. I see him quite often in Europe. And uh, he is extremely sorry not being capable of being with us, but he is conveying to you all his kindest regards. As you know, uh, when I was, let's say, more actively involved in the uh, RA group, I was always struggling for that group to present a, a united front. I feel that our chances to bring down the dogma uh, of the orthodoxy, our chances are considerably better if we show up as a united front. And <coughs> but maybe you will, you will find the statements I'm about to make a uh, little bit excessively provocative. And uh, to justify myself, I don't want to give a, a, an abbreviated biography, but just tell you a teeny little bit of a story which will help you to put me in the picture some, somehow. Let's go back 53 years. <laughs> um, uh, Manhattan East Side, 68th Street at Sloan Kettering, where I just arrived as a fellow, uh, as a pathologist, as a fellow in electron microscopy. And I, one day, uh, I was working at a brand new electron microscope we had, had installed uh, at Sloan Kettering at that time, and uh, my work was, my program was entirely uh, uh, related to a recent discovery made by Charlotte Friend of a uh, virus-induced uh, leukemia in one specific strain of mice. And one day, Charlotte Friend called me in the lab and said, Etienne, <coughs> I have a young fellow from NIH who is so anxious to see viruses uh, on the screen of the electron microscope, viruses in the leukemic mice on the screen of the microscope. Uh, could, could you see him a few minutes? I said, oh, no, no problem. What's his name? Oh, his name is uh, Robert Gallo. So Gallo came down. Uh, he was uh, indeed a fellow at NIH at that time, and we spent a full hour staring at the screen of the, the brand new electron microscope I had just helping installing at Sloan Kettering at that time. And he was most impressed to see on the screen these viruses we speak so much about. That's in 1956. <coughs> so I already indicated how important I feel it is for all of us to present uh, a, a united front so that we can make recommendations for research, recommendations for treatment, recommendations for prevention. And in a way, it's unfortunate that somehow two distinct positions not to say group, I'm trying to avoid that word, uh, have been uh, obvious for the past couple of years. Uh, indeed, <coughs> there are two radically distinct positions. One is to say that uh, the uh, HIV exists, but is a harmless passenger virus. The other position is saying that simply 
uh, HIV does not exist, period. There are problems with these uh, two positions. <coughs> because neither of them uh, is really fully compatible with the scientific available evidence. To claim that HIV is a a uh, harmless virus would at least imply changing its name because if it's related to immunodeficiency, which is an extremely severe medical condition, we could not say that a harmless virus is named HIV. In addition, as an electron microscopist and having been involved for all my scientific career in research on electron microscopy of viruses, I know very well that pathogenic as well as non-pathogenic viruses are both perfectly visible under the electron microscope. The idea that the virus is harmless or non-pathogenic is no explanation for any difficulty we might experience we do experience in visualizing them with the electron microscope. The difficulty we have with the number two position is that it's a, f it's a very fragile position to, to try to defend. Uh, because the non-existence of HIV uh, would be immediately confronted with a picture we are going to see later on in the 1983 uh, Pasteur Institute, Barré, Sinoussi, and uh, Luc Montagnier's paper, uh, the classic paper with the title of so-called isolation of the, the AIDS virus. And uh, there is a picture, an, e an electron microscope picture in that paper on which we are going to come back later. And you will see that we cannot ignore that picture. If we start developing our analysis by picking up uh, 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 among all the published evidence what we like and what we, do, what we don't, then we are doing just as bad work as the orthodox is currently doing for the past 25 years. In addition, simply to state that HIV does not exist would leave very little uh, understanding for the fact that actually uh, nucleic acid sequences are routinely identified in the blood of AIDS patient in what's regarded as most hypothetically the search for viral load by PCR methodology. So in view of, of these difficulties with these two positions, I believe that if we want to have more credibility, we as a group, in our struggle to shake down the orthodox dogma, we uh, have to reach for a more coherent, cohesive analysis of including all available data and not picking up among that accumulation of literature what we like and what we, dis what we don't. And <coughs> an alternative analysis is therefore urgently needed. My suggestion to you today is to consider the fact that human endogenous retroviruses, HERV, can no longer be ignored in AIDS research because HERV do interfere heavily with the interpretation of AIDS research and may offer the alternative explanation of the published data in a coherent understanding of all what's available. 
don't feel that making such a proposal has anything new because it isn't. And by far, uh, I have notes here, in 1992, Medstrand uh, published uh, his work on HERV, finding uh, genomic uh, indication of their presence in all healthy individuals. Even earlier, Pearl in Rochester in 1989 found endogenous sequences of the DNA in the DNA of all normal donors. Incredible as it seems, these facts published in 92, 89 were totally disregarded by the orthodoxy for the past 25 years. If some of you want to uh, brush up a little bit <laughs> on your understanding of HERV, uh, I strongly recommend uh, two important papers, uh, which I give the reference here, the one by Lower in 96, and uh, an interesting review by Nelson in 2003, and uh, I should have added to that slide a much more recent review which I found extremely illuminating and which has been published by Voisset, uh, Robin Weiss and Griffith, and uh, where herbs are really presented as a confusing factor for human retro retrovirus research and in paper in which also HERVs are regarded as endogenous, ubiquitous agents. Indeed, a sizable percentage of the human genome, perhaps as much as 8%, shows strong analogies to the retroviral genome. Therefore, pellets centrifuged from human plasma with variable amounts of circulating DNA inevitably contain retroviral-like sequences identified and amplified by PCR methodologies. These sequences are misinterpreted as HIV markers and used for the alleged quantification of the hypothetic, hyp hypothetical HIV viral load. 8% seems to be the percentage of retroviral sequence in the human genome, according to, to Cho, not far from here, Sacramento, not far from here, and perhaps as much as 10% in mice. What's most surprising is that if you read carefully the little pamphlet attached to the, uh, what the manufacturers of these kits to make PCR viral load determinations. If you read these pamphlets carefully, you find out that uh, the methods they recommend do not in any way permit to isolate retroviral particles. They simply recommend to prepare pellets from human plasma using a very uh, routine little centrifuge called a microfuge. And for those of us who have spent practically their lifetime <laughs> in isolating and purifying animal uh, retroviruses, we know very well that it takes fairly very high accelerations from uh, ultra centrifuges to bring retroviral particles down and that a microfuge will never do that. So in addition, uh, I'm not aware of one single control, one single attempt to demonstrate the presence of retroviral particles in these pellets 